Brandon Meyer to the stage. Put down my coffee. Ah, uh, sweet. Mine are also all cheesy stock photos, so it's really no loss. It's all we know. It's all we know. Um, cool. All right, my name is Brandon Miner. I am a computer vision engineer at Occipital, which means I work with cameras a lot. Uh, so I've done some VR projects with Occipital. Um, so my, my viewpoint is from the perspective of a developer, not really a user. I mean, you can combine those two, but I see things in a com little different way. Uh, which is why I'm so interested about this topic, uh, empathy through virtual reality. Virtual reality encapsulates um, some technologies that just don't give you the same experience as things before. Um, I'm sure, as many of you have experienced that, a lot more than I thought, um, you kind of know the feeling. Uh, so let me set the scene for what I'm talking about today uh, by like, defining these terms. Uh, empathy, not to be confused with sympathy, is the action of understanding the experience of another without having the experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. So nobody has to tell you how they feel. You just, you know how they feel uh, through what you yourself have experienced. On the other hand, virtual reality and mixed reality, which seem to have nothing to do with empathy, have um, full or partial change of one's surroundings through a virtual lens, uh, interaction with virtual objects, and you can experience something that I like to call sensory congruence, which gives you an Immersive, immersive experience. So let me define that. I'm not sure if this is a real term. I'm pretty sure it comes from something. Um, but sensory confluence, how I define it, is when our environment acts in a ways that we expect it to based on our previous experiences. So like, if you are in a room, gravity works the same way, the lights work the same way. If you were in the portal demo, GLaDOS is big because the scales are correct, right? But in other VR demos, you can actually play with this sensory congruence a little bit. You can make your user super large, like in the cleverly named giant cop game, which I think is awesome. You're just a giant cop, and you pick up little people. That is, that is the game. Um, but it plays with this, sense, this sensory congruence, because you're not normally large, and you get to do things that you know, tall people get to do, giant people get to do. Um, so it's, it's VR is unique in the sense that you actually feel this way. There are other games where you become a giant, but you still have the analog stick and, you know, slide around, work the same way. VR, you can actually experience these things in a sensory way, which makes it very unique. However, it's not too unique. VR is not the only thing that does this. And I'll give you an example. So this is my friend Dixon, who I've known from high school. She's pretty cool. This is her drawing. Um, but she has had hallucinations since she was a child. They're not brought on by anything. It's just how she is, right? So she has a hard time telling people what she feels. When she has a hallucination, she can point to something and say it's there. Other people don't know that. So what she did in college was experimented with hallucinatory drugs, which is obviously the right answer. And for her it was, actually, because <laughs> She could, she could control these hallucinations. She could see what was happening. And in fact, by bringing others into the fold, they could experience it too, which was a totally new thing for her. So I'm not advocating this. I'm just saying that for Dixon, it was a very unique experience where that other people could feel what she was feeling, that she's been feeling her entire life, which is something extraordinary from her viewpoint. So in fact, when Dixon heard about VR, and tried it for the first time, she found this same experience. She could see what others could see, and she could create things that others could then see. It was the same sort of experience you would get from a hallucinatory drug. However, the benefit, she claims, is that you can take it off, right? So you can modify your senses in a way that's absolutely controlled, but gives you the same sense of you know, ecstasy, disorientation, Whatever you'd like, whatever you can program, it can be there, but it doesn't have to be restricted, it, and it can be shared. So these, these components are what make empathy a reality in VR. So let's go back to that definition. You have the action of understanding the experience of another without having the experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. In VR, you program these things. You don't tell the user, I am large, be large you give them the ability to be giant, and they are giant now. 
and they experience this the same way they would if you were actually a giant. You can put in hallucinations. You can put in, you know, twisting gravity. And you can get weirder and weirder with it, except you don't. You don't see those things right now, right? So the things I'm familiar with as a developer are people coming up to me saying, I want to use this for medicine. I want to use this for advertising. I want to use this to, you know, to examine the engine in my car. And these are all well and good, and I think these developments should be you know, fully realized. They're great. But I don't see that as the advantage of VR. Instead, I see it more as this empathy machine. And experiences like Dixon's give me that inspiration. So this is a project called The Machine to Be Another. It's like a traveling exhibit around the US. And this is one of their exhibits called Body Swap, which if, I mean, clever enough to figure it out, you put on the headsets and you see through the eyes of the person across from you. But the whole point of this exhibit is that you tell your story while looking through another's eyes. So you tell the other person where you're from, what you've experienced, these different things, while the whole time they see it through your perspective. Um, I can only imagine this is incredibly trippy, um, <laughs> but it gives, you, it gives you an idea of what you could do by literally walking in somebody else's shoes, this empathy machine. And there are more labs that are trying to figure this out, right? So you have Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab, which does some really cool things with race, switching around race. Um, so you're put into the body of somebody who is not your race, and you live a day in their, in their body. Um, and then the machine to be another project, of course, is something you should definitely look up if you haven't heard of it. And then Perspective Chapter 1, The Party, which I'll only call The Party. I'm not going to say that over and over again. Um, is particularly interesting because it's a cinematic experience. So you don't necessarily move around, but you, you have two perspectives to see through. The first is a college girl who um, is kind of like getting into her party mode, right? She's been a quiet person in high school, wants to be in college. And then you have the fratty guy um, who comes in to the same party. And like crazy hijinks ensue, except it's a little more serious than, you know, crazy. So this this last example kind of brings up the question, when would empathy go too far in this context? Um, so like, what, con what constitutes a tasteful switch in empathy where you can really walk in somebody else's shoes? And what context, bad tastes? Like, Perspectives was actually received very well. It won like a Sundance Film Festival Award. Um, but there could be instances where, you know, Things could get out of hand. You could have a very extreme scene that could like trigger somebody if it had been experienced before and could literally give them PTSD if experienced wrongly, like these extreme things. But at what point do you, do you sense that? Uh, and unfortunately, I don't really have an answer. This is something to be ex explored academically still. Um, but I assume it would kind of be like pornography in that you know it when you see it. Um, and I mean, that is an unfortunate answer. It's even frustrating for pornography. But it'd be interesting to see <laughs> where this goes in the future as far as that is concerned. So I mean, given these concerns, I think empathy is still something to be valued in VR, only because VR is the only platform that I know of that can give such a strong sense of it. I don't see the future of VR particularly just in the realm of video games, although, like I said before, video games are a very strong source of, you know, uh, inspiration for developers, obviously. But I think in order to be very successful as a platform, you're going to have to wrap in these, these emotive elements just because VR does that anyway. I mean, if you're going to sense something, eventually people will sense it strong enough that the absence of that sense, I think, is just going to give a bad experience. They're just going to be used to it. Uh, this is clearly not something you do now. I mean, if you're in space shooting things, it sounds awesome. But Later on, space shooting things without like a deep love interest that you've been working with for six months might be a little weird. Um, I don't know. Um, but anyway, all these reasons are why I think empathy is actually VR's killer app. Um, so feel free to contradict me or you know, argue with me, but I think I have a pretty strong case for it. And also, I love this photo. It's just <laughs> so precious. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my talk. Uh, I'm Brandon Miner. Please ask me things. So thank you. Yeah. Let's do maybe like five minutes of questions. Cool. So you mentioned your friend Dixon. Um, and 
So did Dixon feel like her maybe anxieties or experience around having halluc like hallucinations was then more bearable, controllable, or like otherwise like better in whatever case after like sharing an experience with Ruby? That's the sense I got uh, in my uh, correspondence with her. It seems like the empathy meant everything. Like after people knew what she was feeling and that it could be legitimized, it was, it was okay. Like she could experience these things and people wouldn't judge her the way they would before. Yeah. Were her own symptoms like alleviated at all? Like in those no. experiencing? No, not at all. Um, but that wasn't the problem. Yeah. yeah. Because she had just grown up with it. It wasn't a problem for her. Yeah. Yeah. In the case of the machine to be another where we're both wearing two sets. Mm -hmm. No, it's just a cram it's just a camera stream, that one. Um, so what is your work as a developer? It's like streaming it and, uh, I mean, in that instance, yeah, it would just be a, a simple camera stream. But there would be many, many ways you could um, change that. I mean, you could put in their hometown, right? You could walk around their hometown. Or you could, um, you know, see their spouse by you instead of by them. I mean, there are myriad ways you could change that. But this one was just a simple camera streaming. Um, yes? Yes. My background, I'm with the graphic architect magically. So gotcha. I've, a lot of seen, I've seen it not work more than I've seen it work. Sure. And all of those weird things like the triggers, I remember moving an object back. It was a room like this. It just keep going back, keep going back. There was no occlusion switched on. When you went behind the wall, your eyes immediately just started twitching of like, ah, it's like, what just happened? I can still see it, but it's behind the wall, and I know the wall's there. Oh, that's crazy. And there was all these weird edits. I mean, even in the real system, Polar and magically final system still has all yeah, absolutely. edits. And I just wonder how they interact with these sensory issues, especially people like Dixon, who already have hallucinations and things like that. That would be, that's, an, ac still that's an academic area to explore, yeah. But, uh, um, I, would, I would guess there's a, there would be a one size fits all for these. Um, in the fact that, you know, occlusions are occlusions and that you can, if you can sense that, you can program it in. Um, but as far as um, people with, I want to say extrasensory perceptions, but that is absolutely mm -hmm. wrong. Um, people who, who would experience things a little differently, um, it'd be hard to investigate. I mean, you would almost have to have them develop. Even, that, even if you just use away all the time, <laughs> just having this thing here, it flickers or it does something weird. Yeah. Even as a normal-ish person, it still has that trigger effect, like something's wrong with it. And this is, this, is one of the, this is one of the current problems with VR, right, is that you have these triggers. Where the whole development process is trying to smooth this out, so you have as many, as many good experiences as you have bad, more good experiences than bad. Yeah, that's, that's, that, you're exactly right. Yeah, I mean, these things need to be addressed. Do you have one more question, Brandon? Okay. So one part of empathy is social aspect, right? Where yeah. The uncanny valley in VR where you're, Eye gaze isn't being tracked yet, right? So you're not getting this weird interaction where you can't actually get a particular person. Because they're not looking at you the way they're looking at the person. Correct. How did that work? Are you, are you eye tracking the weirdo or? In a virtual reality environment? Yeah. Probably not. Because you can just program that in. In a mixed reality environment, it becomes much harder. Uh, because you would need a way to, to track your environment and make it real. Um, so it's a, it's a subtle difference between the two. Uh, mixed reality would be much harder, uh, but it would obviously need to be addressed to do the same thing. Uh, so all those demos I showed um, do this on a very surface level or even a cinematic experience like Perspectives was. 